So um, epigenetics and reprogramming uh, is a very important issue. So historically, um, the nuclear transfer experiments half a century, century ago from John Gurdon really proved that doing differentiation, doing development of an organism, the nucleus doesn't change. It doesn't lose the potency to make a new animal. So that was a very fundamental discovery. It didn't really sink in how important that was until Dolly the sheep was generated in the mid-70s. And this combined, so that was the first cloned mammal, where um, researchers from Britain took a mammary gland cell, took the nucleus, inserted it into an enucleated egg, and generated a new sheep. So this caught the attention of the public and combined with human embryonic stem cells, which were also discovered around this time, this gave um, rise to the concept of um, therapeutic cloning. Now, I got very interested in, in, in nuclear cloning because I was interested in epigenetics. Now, epigenetics is the um, uh, change of gene expression, not by sequence alterations, but by modification of the um, chromatin and of the um, of modifications of the DNA, for example, DNA methylation. So cloning, of course, is all about epigenetics. You take a adult cell and the let's say a liver cell, which has all the genes active which you need for liver function, but not the genes which you need for embryonic development. They are silent. They were used before this animal, when this animal developed. So what you have to do is, or what, what the egg does after the transfer of the nucleus into the egg, it reprograms the epigenetic state of the liver, which assures liver-specific gene expression, to a state which assures embryonic, embryonic gene expression. So that's, I think, is a very interesting and fundamental issue. So we got immediately interested in using this technology to, technology to study epigenetics in development on a totally unbiased way. Um, so we adapted this nuclear transfer technology and learned how this works. It's inefficient. Clones do develop, but in general, they're all abnormal. Very few survive longer. And if they survive, they're in general abnormal, like Dolly. Dolly had to be killed in, when she was six years old because she was abnormal. And that happens with most clones. So, but anyway, this was interesting mechanistically. But to put it into a therapeutic perspective, um, it allowed to, m to generate customized cells for, for uh, therapy. So what I mean with that? When you need, in transplantation medicine, when you need, let's say, a heart, you have to find a suitable donor, which is as close as possible to yourself, uh, immunologically, so the cells are not rejected, or the heart is not rejected when transplanted. But it's, that's a difficulty. Often you don't find suitable donors. So, but when you take now a skin cell from the patient, and do nuclear transfer and generate an embryonic stem cell from that, this, of course, will be absolutely identical to the patient. So therefore, if you would make heart cells out of this, they would not be rejected. Basically, you can make any cell type from the ZS cells. They would not be rejected. They're the patient's own cells. So this is called therapeutic cloning. And we indeed showed um, that this works in principle in mice. So we took um, um, a, a mouse which was immune deficient, it didn't have any peripheral immune cells, no B and T cells, and did nuclear transfer, generated a, um, um, a nuclear transfer embryonic stem cell from those, corrected the gene defect, differentiated these cells to hematopoietic stem cells, put them back into the mouse, and it restored the immune system. So therapeutic cloning works in mammals. So that was interesting. But if you want to translate this to humans, the problem is you would need human eggs. 
And this is a real big problem. This is an ethical problem. It's a problem how do you get eggs. It's just not acceptable. It would never be for routine, um, 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 for a routine um, application. So the key issue was to learn how the egg really accomplishes this epigenetic reprogramming. And I think we still don't know, but we know how to do it without the egg. That was the IPS cells from um, you know, 2006 uh, in a seminal paper published from Yamanaka, where you can reprogram cells in the Petri dish without eggs. So you take fibroblasts and um, reprogram those with few factors and get cells which are like embryonic stem cells. So this is now a straightforward way to make customized cells for therapy and for studying diseases. So we immediately used that technology um, and learned quite a lot about what is, what's happening? What is the epigenetic, uh, what's the difference to nuclear transfer, for example, is an interesting question. And many of these questions are not resolved at this point. So um, we can make these iPS cells, they're called induced pluripotent stem cells, which are patient specific. Um, but how different are they from ES cells, epigenetically? And this is, these are a number of open questions which we are pursuing, many others in the field pursue, because if you go to humans, you want to be sure you have the right cells, you have high quality cells, which can uh, generate the cells you need for, for um, therapeutic applications. And that's one of the key issues in the field at this point. So when looking forward, I believe this technology has, uh, the IPS technology has revolutionized um, medicine, uh, stem cell research, and the implications for medicine are, I think, enormous. So I believe this technology will indeed, um, it will be extremely important to study complex human diseases in the culture dish, where we're doing that, and many people do this, um, and eventually for um, regenerative medicine, for cell transplantation um, and tissue repair. And I think they are very remarkable um, advances, so I think it will work. And so I think it's a very exciting time in the field to, um, 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 to advance really medical, um, um, uh, medical um, advances and getting medical information on, on complex diseases and develop therapeutic strategies. A big interest is uh, development. How does, what the mechanism of development, of embryonic development, how does an egg develop to a complex organism which has brain and liver and uh, many different organs. And originally, more than half a century ago, one possibility, so, but clearly the difference is the liver and the brain are different because they express different genes. The brain, brain specific genes and the liver, liver specific genes. So why is that? And one hypothesis had been maybe in the brain, the liver-specific genes are eliminated, and the brain-specific genes are there, so they're expressed. And the liver, it's the other way around. The brain-specific genes are eliminated, um, and, and the liver-specific genes remain. So is there genetic alterations during development? That was a key question. Now we know, no, it's not the case. The genes are all in all cells, but um, they're differentially expressed because they're epigenetically in different states. But this was not known in the 1950s or so. And then came the seminal cloning experiments, which really asked that question. If it was possible to use a somatic cell like a skin cell to make an animal, then there couldn't be any gene loss. Because if there was gene loss, you couldn't make, if you lost the liver specific genes from the brain, you never could make from those cells an animal because there would be no liver, which was functional. So this was a key question. And the Gurdon experiments resolved that question. They showed clearly you can make animals not very efficient. It was very inefficient. So it was a strong argument that there was um, gene loss during development. So this was settled, but it was in frogs. These experiments were done in frogs. so. They didn't catch much of the 
um, uh, interest of the public. And the history of cloning is a bit rocky. Um, so there was um, um, uh, really, there were a couple of scandals actually in the, in, the, in, the, in the cloning history. The first one was when people claimed they could make um, mice by cloning in the end of the 70s by a certain method, I want to go into this now, and it turned out it was a fraudulent experiment. It took a while um, um, to, to correct it. And there was a famous paper which then showed, a paper which showed that one can make this very efficiently, the nuclear transfer, but cloning wouldn't work. The, in this case, the experiment was done by taking the nucleus of a zygote out of the fertilized egg and replacing it with a somatic nucleus, and the embryo failed. So the conclusion was cloning in mammals doesn't work. But then still, Dolly came. So it did work eventually. So what was the difference? Well, the difference was very um, striking. In the original experiments, the nucleus of the egg was removed of the fertilized egg. And then it was replaced with the somatic nucleus. But if you, do, if you take the oocyte and remove before fertilization just the oocyte and remove its haploid nucleus and replace that now with a somatic nucleus, then it worked. That's how Dolly was made. So there was just a technical difference which was very interesting and caught the, the attention of many people why that would be. And uh, cloning is always done now generally with using oocytes instead of fertilized eggs. But cloning is very inefficient. And, um, and because this reprogramming is a stochastic process, many things can go wrong and many things do go wrong. And that was one of the early interests we had in trying to understand what goes wrong. And what we know, what particularly goes wrong, is a certain class of genes which are called imprinted genes. So imprinted genes are genes which um, are only expressed when they come from father or from mother, and they play a role in early development. They're very important there. And those are often deregulated, and that contributes highly to the uh, abnormalities of cloned animals.